All right. Let's pray and we'll get started on our class tonight. Father God, thank you for this evening. Thank you for everybody that's already here for class. Uh, we pray that you'd bring those who are planning to be here uh, in safely. I know that we may have a few that are trying to still get in, so just get them here, Lord. And we uh, welcome your Holy Spirit because ultimately, Lord, uh, you're really the one who teaches all of us. And uh, we need you here in this room tonight, Lord. I ask that you would speak through me and just use me as a vessel that you would flow through. But we pray that you would give us all understanding. Help us to grow in the knowledge of your word and of the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> if you've missed the last week, two, three, four, whatever, uh, you can go online and always watch the ones we've done before. But... What we're to now, uh, and let me just backtrack for just a minute to give you an idea uh, very quickly. Um, we've been going through terms uh, that emphasize the character of sin. And we've talked about uh, everything from a very minor type of sin, uh, like the term, the, the Hebrew term chada, that means missing the mark, which is an archery term. Uh, and, and it's also in the Greek hamartino. Uh, all the way up to, which, very, by the way, has uh, like very small repercussions um, to moving up to irreligion, transgression, uh, iniquity, or, or rather the, which is the lack of integrity. All of these have a Hebrew word, and most of them have a Greek word that goes with it as well. Uh, last week we talked about rebellion and uh, treachery. And we were mo we've been moving up in the level of sin uh, as we've been going through. And tonight, we're going to cover two that have some of the greatest consequences. We're going to talk about perversion first, which really, the, our, our, our textbook has the word perversion there. But really and truly, this Hebrew word, awa and awan, is better translated in uh, iniquity. In fact, in the New American Standard Version, uh, which is what we'll be kind of looking at uh, here in, uh, we'll, we'll see it, it, it always translates a one as iniquity. And when we looked at the word iniquity back a few weeks ago, and they had a, an English transliteration for uh, the lack of integrity or iniquity, and the word was a wall, A-W-A-L, notice this is A-W-A-H, or A W O N, or A W V O N, or A A V O N. So they're very, very similar. They have two of the the first Hebrew letters, and Hebrew reads from right to left. So it's a little different. If we were reading it right here, um, so let's see, where's the one I'm looking at? Uh, I was going to show you. Where did it go? I'm... I'll get to it in a minute because I was in a... I'll talk to you about it in a minute. It's right down here under the Spiritus and all this. But we'll, I'll show you the way it looks and how you read the words uh, from here, from right to left. I can't read Hebrew. Um, every time I've tried to take Hebrew, financial issue, Schedule issue, calendar issue, different stuff's always happened. I've never been able to get through the class. So it's all, um, it's all Greek to you anyways, right? Yeah. All right, but where we're going to start tonight is uh, let's all look up uh, the, the verse, Proverbs 12, verse 8. We're going to start off our conversation uh, looking at that. And this, I did I, on this one I didn't get into... Uh, it's literal meanings outside of the use of, uh, I really wanted to stick with uh, this idea of perversion or uh, iniquity. And perversion, I know in our English time nowadays, we think of perversion, we think of, um, we tend to put perversion with uh, a pervert, right? We, we think of a sexual type of idea. That's what this word, in our culture, in our day and time, perversion normally goes with sexual sin. But I want you to think outside of that box because the word actually means to pervert something, to change it, to distort it, right? In the Hebrew, the word awa uh, or awan 
it means to bend or twist. And so very similar to uh, back a few, uh, like two weeks ago, when we talked at the word a wall, it meant uh, to pervert, which is this. Which one are you wanting to? A wall. A-W-A-H is the way it's found in Proverbs 12.8. Uh, when we get down here to Hosea, it changes to A. W-O-N-E or A-V-O-N, just depending on which uh, Greek or Hebrew lexicon you're looking at. So, uh, looking at Proverbs 12.8, would somebody like to read that? Okay, go ahead, Jerry. The person is praised according to his purpose, which is wisdom applied to practice, and one of the more blind is despised. Therefore, the wise man is despised. All right, so where it says warped there, is this word. And if you, you know anything about warped wood, it's wood that's twisted, right, or bent. So that's what the word uh, awan means. So when we start applying that now, we're, we're seeing how someone can have a warped or twisted mind, but we're about to start using this word uh, to reference sin, to apply to sin. And it's got an even deeper meaning and a more powerful meaning. Um, it's It's... It's next in line to abomination, and I'm going to show you why this is so strong, why God uh, really has a problem with uh, this, and why it's so dangerous for us to move into this level of sin, because it's more than just committing a single act, and uh, I'll promise I'm going to get into that in just a minute. Let's go now to Hebrews 5.5. 5. We're going to start moving our way toward what it would look like uh, using sin. I mean, not Hebrews. Hosea 5.5, 5. for everybody watching at home, if you can't read <laughs> the, yeah, I know it, Hosea 5.5, 5. right, if someone would like to read that, go ahead. All right, so it says, and Israel and Ephraim stumble in their iniquity, right? Um, some of your versions, I know I have an NIV open over here, and the word sin is there. But sin is too broad and general a term, so I brought my New American Standard, which is the closest. Uh, it's a version that is the closest to the Hebrew and Greek in the English. And so um, I, pr I prefer it when I'm going to go into a deeper study because of, of being able to do that. NIV is a much smoother read if you're just trying to read the Bible and enjoy your reading and maybe understand. It, it doesn't sound choppy. NIV is great for that. New Living Translation is great for that. But if you're wanting to really see what the word closest would relate to, the New American Standard uh, is the closest to the Hebrew and Greek, according to Hebrew and Greek scholars. So uh, we just saw there in, in uh, 5 5. Uh, moreover, the pride of Israel testifies against him, uh, and Israel and Ephraim stumble in their iniquity. Judah has stumbled with them. They've stumbled in their iniquity. We're, we're, I'm about to kind of help explain how iniquity is working here. Once we read 14.1 now in Hosea, we're going to stop for a minute. I'm going to break this out a little bit more for you. Let's turn over to chapter 14, verse 1 of that same book. Would someone like to read that one? Uh, did you read Hosea? Yeah, Hosea. Did I say Hebrews again? I hope not. I guess. Uh, 14. 14 verse 1. Yeah, I... I probably didn't say it clear enough. Hosea 14, verse 1. Yes. All right. Thank you. So here's what the writer in our uh, theology book says. 
Here emerges the concept of sin not merely as an isolated act, not merely as isolated acts, but as an actual alteration of the condition or character of the sinner. This is where this word becomes very important and the meaning to bend or to twist. Because if you're a, say you're a, a follower of Christ, you're a believer, right? You love God. Even in the uh, ancient times, you're, if you're a, a Hebrew, a Jewish person who's following Jehovah God, if you sin, it's a single act, right? You told a lie, you got caught, or you just recognized that you lied, and so you confessed it. It's a, it's a sin, it's now forgiven. It's Christians, when we confess our sin, the blood of Jesus Christ forgives our sins, and He remembers it no more. That's what He tells us, right? But, but what we're talking about here, the difference between a law, a one, this Hebrew word, and some of the other words for sin that we've seen in the past, like that one, hamartano, that is speaking of missing the mark, because you can miss the mark. If you're aiming at not telling a lie anymore, and you do, then you've missed the mark, right? You didn't hit the bullseye that you were aiming for. You've sinned, okay? So that's a, but that's like an individual sin. It's a, it's a one-time deal where you confess it and forgiven. How does one get from committing a, a hamartano type of sin, a missing the mark type of thing, all the way to something that would be called iniquity or perversion? Well, it's, 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 a, it's committing sin so much beginning to practice sin, that the sin begins to have an effect on us. Let's, let's, um, I'm going to use a board, for instance, all right? And I know with Eric in here, he's a carpenter and worked with wood all of his life. But if you take a two-before, say an eight-footer, and you want it to remain straight, do you lean it against a wall at an angle? No, right? I think all of us know that about wood. If you lean it, Jeremy, how are you, brother? It's going to begin to arc because gravity is going to pull on it. So the longer you leave something in a bad position, the more it's going to begin to take the shape of that position. All right? So that's a very nice picture in our minds. The longer we walk in a sin and stay in sin, the more we begin to become bent to fit and look like that sin. We change. That's what he's talking about here. He's saying that uh, we have, we can uh, the, the whole concept of sin begins to emerge here and change into something different. It, it actually begins to alter uh, the condition or the character of the sinner. So now our condition as a sinner, as a person, is being altered. We're being twisted. We're being warped. We're we're changing. We're literally bending to fit the sin. And that's much more problematic. That's a, that's a higher level of sin when you begin to take the twisted shape of the perversion or the sin. You now are perverted, right? And I don't, again, get the uh, sexual thing only out of your mind. It fits very well with the sexual because... God made us to for sex to fit within this realm, the realm of marriage. We're not to lust. We're not to commit adultery. We're not to ha have homosexual relations. We've got all these things that are a perversion of what God made sex for, right? So that's why it gets applied to sex so much because when we do things that are sinfully sexual, it's a perversion. But... Perversion or iniquity can be applied to anything that w is twisted. If we take God's word and we uh, we say, well, it doesn't mean that. It means this, right? To fit what we want it to say and to allow us to live the life we want to live, we start twisting God's word this way and that way. We're perverting the scriptures. We're making God's word say something that will make us happy. It's what our itching ears want to hear. And so we start twisting and changing things. And God is saying, you don't want to be here. You don't want to end up in a place where, uh, like Israel, Israel kept sinning so much that they became a warped nation. That's what he, that verse in Hebrews 14, 1 is saying, Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. You have stumbled because of your iniquity. 
You've, you've stumbled. You keep tripping up because you're bent. You're warped. You, you have a rebellious attitude that has been there so long that now you've got this warp or twistedness of rebellion. You become that. You're not just a, a, a person who rebelled once. Now you are rebellion. You're not just someone who has lusted once or twice. Now you've become lust. You've, you've literally twisted into that. And that's you, you yourself now are being affected. That's why this is such a high level of sin. I want to take you to a couple of verses in Exodus now. Exodus chapter 20, which is where the Ten Commandments are found. These will be the last two where we look at this word. Just as our examples. There's a lot more in Scripture. This word is used a lot in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 20, and we're going to look at verse 5. If you're watching from home and you can't hear people read in the room, I hope you're looking up and reading yourself. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. All right, would somebody like to read? And if you're going to read for us, start in verse 4 and read down. All right, thank you. That's a, an interesting passage because he's talking about uh, not making an idol, not committing idolatry, worshiping false gods and images. And he says, uh, you shall not worship them, you shall not serve them, for I, the Lord of God, am a jealous God. But it's when he gets to the part of saying, uh, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me. He says visiting the iniquity, visiting the sin. So this thing will follow. Iniquity will, that bent, right? We're talking about something being warped. So he says, whenever you're sinful, uh, when you're sinning and your re repetition of sinning in certain areas goes on and on and you actually begin to, here's a good way of seeing how this looks. When you get to a place that you say, I don't believe that, that living with someone outside of marriage is a sin. Or I don't believe that getting drunk is a sin. Or I don't believe that smoking weed is a sin. Or I don't believe that lying. Or I don't believe whatever it is, right? But pick any one of those things you want to. Any of those sins out there. Anything that people are out there justifying nowadays, right? And you, when you get to the place that you say, well, well, I don't think that's wrong. I don't believe that's a sin, right? If you can find it in God's Word where He says, do not. But you all of a sudden have come to a place that you're going to stand up against God and you're going to say, God, I know that you might be right about some things, but on that one you're wrong. What has happened? Well, you're no longer just rebelling. You're no longer just accidentally or being carried away by the lust of your heart for a moment. You're no longer just falling to smoking a joint because of peer pressure. No, you've done it so long that now you've convinced yourself, this is right, I don't want to change. I'm going to actually not just, I'm not just going to fall once because of peer pressure. I'm not going to just be in rebellion against God by doing it. No, I'm going to actually move to the place. Can you see how we're moving? I'm using that one thing, but honestly, you could put any sin you want to in there. That one's just one that I've heard a lot of people tell me, God made it and all that stuff. So, um, But you, 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 you're moving, right? Same sin, but because you continue to argue for it, we could put... Lust or, or perversion and sexual things there. We could put uh, a ton of different things there. It's cheating the IRS. <laughs> we, we could put a lot of things, right, in that place. But you, you commit it once because you're tempted. You, if you keep doing it, you're moving to a place of rebellion against God. But you still agree with God that it's wrong. Does that make sense? 
We still agree that it's wrong. Rebellion, which is a word we talked about last week, says it's wrong, but I dislike it so much. I'm going to continue to do it, right? I like the money when I don't, when I hide things from the IRS or whatever it is. Uh, and so we continue to do it. But where this word comes in, we have now been twisted. We've been twisted. See, over here, we're still a straight board, but we're just rebelling. When you move to that final stage, you're twisted. Now you are beginning to argue with God and say, this is what truth is. Ah, thanks. Don't want all that junk up there. Yeah. We're back. It'll fall asleep on me sometimes. So. All right. So that's what's going on. That's how come this is right next to abomination, which is the worst of sin. It's because this affects you. This affects you. This shows that you've moved from this to this to this. Does that make sense? That's why this is so, so dangerous for us. You know, any of us, we all sin. Um, we all, I mean, we stumble. We stumble in our minds. We stumble with our mouths. We stumble with our heart. We all sin. We all make mistakes. And uh, we all have our favorite sins. We all have areas that we, we crave more and they just, they entice us. And it's really hard to keep ourselves from those certain sins. And everybody's there a little bit different. But we, what we want to do as a Christian, you want to stay in this area where you occasionally stumble because it overtook you. But you confess it quickly and you continue. What does confess mean? In the Greek, in 1 John 1, 9, the word confess means to agree with God. You see, if you're still in this camp and you make a mistake, you sin. If I have a lustful thought, right? Or maybe I look at something I shouldn't on uh, uh, one of my devices or something, right? When I, uh, when I go, oh my God, I, I knew I should not have followed that or looked at that or whatever. When I do that, what's happening? Well, I'm convicted and I'm agreeing with God that what I did in my mind was wrong, right? So I'm staying in a good area. Not that I had a look or had a lustful thought. That's not good, but it's a whole lot better than going there and staying Right? It's a whole lot better than bookmarking it or screenshotting it and keeping it. That's rebellion. But you see, rebellion is better than iniquity because iniquity, and now the sin has got me. Now I, I don't, I don't, back here, I, when I confess, I agree with God that what God says is wrong is wrong. Even though I did it, I'm agreeing with God that I'm a sinner and I'm confessing it. Even in rebellion, I can agree with God that I've been rebellious. I've sinned. I, I went deep into sin, even for a few days. But I knew the whole time. I felt the conviction of God's Spirit on it. I mean, I'm, I knew it was wrong. God, forgive me. I'm sorry, right? But if I move into this because I've been playing with these areas so long that it's like having wood in water or wood leaning, you, you, you begin to warp. You begin to warp. And what, what good is warped wood? It's firewood, isn't it? That's what it is. Or you're building something really shoddy and you don't care. <laughs> but it's no good. It's just no good. You can't come out straight on your building if you use warped wood, right? We don't want to be warped because we're vessels of the Lord. Thank God. God can, God can call us out of. He calls us to leave behind iniquity. This is not unfixable for God. If you've gotten to a place where you're saying homosexuality is not a sin, sleeping with people is not a sin, this is not a sin, this is not a sin. If you've gotten to that place and all of a sudden God's Spirit begins to open your eyes and your mind and you begin to recognize, wait a minute, somehow I have bought into the world and the culture and the lies and I've agreed with lies. I'm going to go back to what God's Word says. If you humble yourself before God and you say, God, I was wrong to deny what you said, to argue with what you said, and you begin to say, I agree with you. Father, forgive me. You can go back from this and start moving your wealth back. That's the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the power of the work of the Holy Spirit. He can do that for a heart that humbles itself. But we have to humble ourselves and repent of our iniquity. Hosea 14.1, that's exactly what he was doing. Israel, return to me. Your iniquity 
has caused you to go off into this, but I'm calling you to return. If it was impossible for them to return, he wouldn't have called them to it. But he's calling them to it. All right, so the last one I want us to look at, it's very similar to this, but it's Exodus 34. While you're in Exodus, let's look at that one real quick. Verse, uh, chapter 34, verse 7. Chapter 34, verse 7. Uh, how about whoever reads this one, start in verse 6 and read all the way through 8, 6 through 8. You want that one? And the Lord passed by, and therefore him, and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-serving, and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and upon the children's children, and to the third day of the generation. All right. So you're seeing it. It's, it's not mentioned in the Ten Commandments there, but he's saying it in a whole other setting about uh, how, he, uh, how he has compassion and he's slow to anger and he's abounding in love and, and truth and so on. And then he mentions that thing again, that when, when our sin moves to the level that we argue with God, that we begin to say, this is not wrong. Um, there's a lot of things that are out there, um, you know, uh, about uh, racism right now. My grandfather, well, probably both of them, were of a generation and of a mindset of that thinking, right? If, if you ask them, or at least I know one for sure, would have said, this is, this is what's right, would have stood his ground, Right? When it's like that, it's very easy for that to be passed to the next generation. Okay? If you had somebody who did something wrong, but knows it's wrong, they're going to continue to confess it. Say, say a father. Uh, I don't know. Let's say a father gets caught in a lie. Right? When he confesses that he's a liar and he's, he says it's wrong, he's still teaching his children that it's wrong. This level of sin doesn't teach that lying is wrong anymore. So if someone uh, acts, you know, sinfully by picking at somebody because they're Hispanic, Native American, African American, white, whatever it is, right? They may have done something sinful. They may have gotten caught up in uh, something going on, right, in the crowd that they were with. But when they're done or when it's out of their mouth, they feel so bad. Okay? Did they speak in an unkind way about someone because they're different from them? Yes. But they confess it. This is a mindset where you teach your children that this is okay. Do you see that? This is different. This is huge. This passes sin on to the second, the third generation. Because... There is no teaching that it's wrong. There's living it and teaching that it's right and defending it. And we could put, we could put, uh, this is why it's very dangerous for uh, a, a mom or a dad to live with a partner. Because you're, you're walking in this iniquity. You're teaching your kids it's okay to live with someone and not be married. You're going against God's word and you're, you've, you've gone to this. You're not just... See, there's a big difference if, if mom or dad is dating and slips up one night, right? That's a sin. It needs to be confessed. It's sexual immorality. If you move to the place where you start repeating doing it, it's rebellion. You know it's wrong, but you keep doing it, okay? But when you move to iniquity, you say move in, and when people say things... Don't judge me. I don't see anything wrong with it. You hear that? Don't judge me. I don't see anything wrong with it. That's this. That's big. Your kids can hear you say, Dad messed up. Dad shouldn't have done that. Guys, I'm sorry. I didn't set a good example for you. Right? This is sin. You're confessing. You're still agreeing with God. This, you're changing God's commandments. 
This will be passed on to your kids. This is a generational curse. This is where generational cursing comes in, which is what Exodus 20, verse 5 is talking about, and what Exodus 34, verse 7 is talking about. It's talking about a bloodline curse of sin that flows down. How many of you have seen drunkenness flow from generation to generation to generation to generation? That's a generational curse, right? It's a generational curse. It starts with somebody who justifies getting drunk. That this is how you handle life, this is how you handle problems, this is what men do, this is what whatever, right? Whatever the justification is. But when that starts, same with porn. Porn is a thing that flows down generationally. Father to son to son to son to son, our, our daughter and so on and so on. How come? Because somebody started at some point and let it move to this level. It's not just a sin of committing an act, making a mistake, but it's moving to a place where you begin to say it's not a sin Men look at pornography, right? When you do that, you have let this generational curse into your family line, and it begins to chase down generation after generation. It doesn't mean it can't be broken. The power of Christ can break anything. But it's why we see those things. And we don't see every kid in a family of an alcoholic become alcoholics, but there's usually at least one that will carry that thing on, right? So does that make sense? And I'm, I promise you, I, I know, you know, no matter what sin I name, uh, either I myself or four or five of you are dealing with it. So I'm trying to hop around on a whole lot of issues. <laughs> so everybody's equally offended, right? Everybody's equally offended. We're a room full of sinners. We are. And, and I've got, and the reason I know so much about this is because I know the family curses that are in my family line. I know the things that my grandfathers and grandmothers struggled with. And I know the things that, uh, as a kid, that I... Uh, thought and spoke because of uncles and aunts and things I was around. And I know how God, Jesus Christ, changed my mindset and my attitude and opened my eyes up to see things that I did not see before. And that's the work of God. But if I had not known Christ, I would be what my grandfather was, what my uncles were. I would be exactly that. I would follow that exactly. Does that make sense? Jesus is what changed my way of thinking about people, about alcohol, about drugs, about sexual things. Jesus is what's changed me about that. Otherwise, I would have the same mindset as my forefathers had. And I'm thankful that my mom and dad's mindset was changed by Christ, who had an even greater impact on me because their view of those things that their parents had walked in had already changed. They, they didn't smoke like my grandfathers did. So that changed immediately. I grew up in a household where that was not approved. That was a difference. So that helped me a whole lot. It became sin to them. It became something that they did not want to do. Whereas for my grandfathers, it may not have been. They didn't really know Christ till the end of their life. And my grandmothers and so on. I'm hoping I'm just using some examples here. Do you, you're understanding what I'm talking about. All right. We're going to move on now to the word abomination. This is one of my favorite areas of sin. <laughs> That sounds really bad when you're talking about sin, doesn't it? But maybe it's because they're the worst, but I, I, guess, I guess until you study this word, all the other words kind of can seem boring, mundane. You just keep using other words for sin, Chris. But whenever you get to this one, you can start lining it all up and you can start seeing how this works. You can see how you move from level to level to level and why it's so important that you confess sin, you turn from it, you run from it, quick, you'd never want to get to this place. This is deadly for not only you, but for the generations that come after you. This is deadly. Let's move to abomination. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 25. If somebody wants to read that, 25 and 26. Deuteronomy 7. Verse 25 and 26. Anybody want to read? You want to? Oh. The graven images of their gods shall you burn with fire. You shall not desire the silver and gold that is on them, nor take it unto yourself, lest you be snared therein, for it is an abomination to the Lord your God. Neither shall you Amen. 
Amen. All right, we're getting into some heavy subject now. What we're talking about in this one is graven images. It's that idolatry thing that we were just noticing he was teaching in the law not to do. He said, if you do this, uh, you're committing this iniquitous sin. Because to begin to have another God means you have desired to worship something else. That's different. How many of you know, you don't by peer pressure just begin to worship something. <laughs> you know, you, peer pressure, you can fall to a quick sin. But if you set up an idol, if you cast an idol and you go out and you buy it and you begin to worship it, that takes a whole lot more forethought. <laughs> You're deciding this is God. That's a decision. That's much bigger. So not only is it iniquitous because it, it twists and perverts us, but the sin itself before God, this kind of is more of a description of how God sees these sins, right? This is kind of how it affects us. It's iniquitous. It's twisting us. But... A lot of the same things that are this are, uh, well, not exactly. This can go from anything, for uh, uh, almost any kind of sin, just repeated and repeated, can cause us to become iniquitous in it. But abominations are a level of sin that are the most heinous sins uh, that a human can commit. And I'm going to show you examples of that as we read through these, so you'll get an idea. But idolatry is where we're starting at. And he's say, saying... Uh, Burn those images in the fire. You are to burn them. Destroy them. And notice he says, you shall not even covet the silver or the gold that is on them. Don't, don't say, well, I'm going to get rid of the idol. Uh, but that's a lot of gold. I can make that into a necklace or ring or something, you know. I'm going to use that for good. Uh, he says, even the gold itself is tainted. It's an abomination. Yeah, you did. You just shifted, right, the value of that. Yes. Oh, thanks. i got to touch the button occasionally. I'm planning on... It just goes back to that. Okay. Okay. All right. So, even the silver or gold, it says, if you bring it into your houses... You will be ensnared by it, for it is an abomination to the Lord. We're talking, we're beginning to move into how uh, uh, the demonic, a spiritual being, can attach itself to physical items and ensnare us. And uh, we see this in the scriptures in multiple places, but this is a very uh, good one to look at. He says, you shall not bring an abomination into your house and like it, uh, and like it come under the ban. You shall utterly detest it and you shall utterly abhor it for it is something to be banned. So, uh, this makes a good point that we we should destroy evil things. Things that God has forbidden we should destroy. We shouldn't go sell it. <laughs> you know what I mean? If it's evil for you, did it come back? <laughs> what is the deal with this? The internet's dropping I'll just have to turn it off here in a minute, but it's going to take too much of my time fixing it. Okay, stay up there. I was going to use this to show you something here in a minute, but um, and I may not even have to. I'm kind of explaining it as we go. Um, so that's our first one. Let's go ahead now and, and look at Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22. So that one dealt with idolatry, and it's showing us how this level of sin... You're going to have demonic things attached to even the items used in it that can, not always will, but can uh, come and begin to bring problems to your home. Um, I know stories of people who have had um, a lot of uh, Stephen King novel, novels or horror movies and things like that, and they're, uh, they were having tremendous nightmares, bloody, bloody nightmares, and could not get out of it. And when when uh, we began to pray and say, God, what... What is going on? Why is this happening? And why can't they get free from it? Um, there was something that was attached to those books. Now, there are plenty of people, Christian people, who have Stephen King novels and scary movies in their house that don't have those problems. But the, the thing I want you to understand is you give opportunity for a spirit of fear to attach itself to something that you, when you long to be made afraid by the entertainment of fear, 
you're opening a door for something to come and begin to uh, torment you. That's what they do. And when we, we open a door, we welcome it in. And the same thing with lust or any of that. If we watch movies with uh, porn in it, you, you won't always get a demon uh, of lust attached to you. But if you begin to look at those things, you're saying, I want that. And a spirit of lust will begin to move and try to connect itself to you because it knows it can get fed by you. So we're not here to talk about all the demonic. We're here to talk about the sin. But you just need to be aware since it's right there in that verse. This is how things can work. And uh, if you're having trouble getting rid of uh, lust or something in your life, but you've got magazines, porn, or anything in your house, you need to get rid of that. That's a big thing. Spiritual housing is very important to getting rid of a spirit of fear, lust, greed. Um, if you're having problems that you can't seem to get ahead financially, um, every time you get a little money, it gets taken somehow. Something comes up. You ever felt like everything you touch just is cursed and it all goes away? Probably is. If you've stolen, if you've taken something that's not yours, if you haven't paid somebody what you said you would pay them, if you signed a contract to pay this much for this work and you don't pay that, you're under a curse. God will allow the demons to come and torment you. And I'm getting that straight out of the mouth of Christ in the Gospels. He will allow the tormentors to come after you if you don't forgive someone. So we, we want to take God seriously with these matters and not play around. These are very serious and they affect us and the generations that follow us. All right. I was trying to get to Leviticus and I keep talking. Does anybody have Leviticus 18 already? Yes. Go ahead, whoever. 18, yes. All right. So what would that be talking about? Homosexuality, right? He's telling them, do not, uh, don't lie. You shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. Um, it is an abomination, right? So it is something that is detestable. Let me read to you what uh, our theology book says. It says, uh, these things... They, these practices virtually nauseate God. That's to the level they're at. These are not things that are simply uh, God just peevishly objects to it. But he is literally nauseated by these, this level of sin. These, these things uh, cause, uh, they produce revulsion. He, that's, that's the level that this is at. This is not a white lie. These are things that God absolutely abhors, he detests, he hates, they make him nauseated. And that's that's the list that we're going to be looking at. So we've seen 1822 has to do with homosexuality. The one before that had to do with worshiping idols. Let's look while we're at Leviticus chapter 20 verse 13. Someone like to read that one. Leviticus 20:13. Okay, Amber. Okay. All right. It, in the according to God, homosexuality is a capital offense. It is you are to be put to death. Now you can commit a lot of other sins, and as I said way back when we were looking at some of these earlier sins, uh, you know. If you committed this sin or that sin, he might have you bring a couple of doves as a sin offering. <laughs> he might have you offer a calf for a sin offering. He might have you offer some grain for a sin offering, right? There was something you could bring that was going to cost you, but it was something you could bring and you'd be forgiven. But we're at a level of sin now where these bring death. And we're living in a nation that has said, this is not a sin. So what has happened to the culture of our nation, or at least a portion of our nation, they have moved into iniquity. They've moved into the place where they're telling God he's wrong if they believe in him at all. There are churches that have become iniquitous churches because they teach the Bible, but on verses like this, to be popular, to be able to get folks to come in, they twist verses about homosexuality into saying it's not a sin. And I... It's, it's got, it takes a lot of twisting to take all the verses in the Old and the New Testament that describe this as an abominable sin 
and make it into something that is not a sin. It takes a lot of twisting, but churches, pastors, ministers, whole denominations are doing that very thing in this day and time. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't create the world. I didn't write the book. I, I'm going to live for however many years I live, and I will not uh, have anything but what God gives me on the other side. I am that finite. I don't want to stand before a God who is outside of time, who spoke everything that I know into existence and gave me breath to breathe. I don't want to stand against Him and tell Him, you know what, I don't like what you said about this. You have offended me, God. I don't want to stand there. i got a fear of God. i got a respect and an awe for Him. And I don't know any of you or anybody on this planet. I don't care what position you hold in life. Nobody on this planet will live beyond the number of years God gives them. And when you die, you don't take any of your power, your reputation, your name, your money. You take nothing with you. You die and you face the judge. The king of all kings. You're going to face him. That's just the way it is. So why would we want to buck him all of our life and then come to the end of our life and have to face him and say, oh, I guess I was wrong about all these subjects. But man, I was popular on earth. Everybody liked me. Everybody liked me. And I'm not saying that we should be mean or hateful to people who don't agree with us on these things. We should not. Jesus loved prostitutes, sinners, tax collectors, thieves. He loved them. He did not love their sin, and He never, he never condoned their sin. He loved the people. And that's exactly what God tells us to do. Love people. Love all people. Love sinners. Love everybody. And pray for them. Bless them. Don't persecute them. Pray for them. Pray for them. Try to lead them out of their sin. That's loving someone. But putting somebody down, condemning somebody, just calling them names and all of that, that's not the heart of Christ. Not for the homosexual, not for the liar, not for the drug addict, not for the drunkard, not for anybody else. They all will send you to hell. Lying will send you to hell. Denying Christ will send you to hell. <laughs> we need to pray for everybody and not, not take up that mantle of the super religious where we just put down people who are bad people. People who don't, people who break God's commands, and so we just sit back and judge all of them. There's only one judge. That's in the scripture. It's Jesus Christ. It's not us. All right, so let's move on now to Deuteronomy 22:5. Deuteronomy 22:5, and we'll stay in Deuteronomy for a while. Come to this class, you learn where books are in the Bible. 22.5. Someone like to read that one. A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all, you, all who do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. All right. Now, I don't think that's telling the woman that you can't wear pants. Everybody's... <laughs> and and it's, it's not getting to that level. But what it's, it's, it's moving into... And I think it's maybe more easily identified when uh, my wife was over at um, Upper Park about a month or so back. She was sitting there with some family and friends eating at a table. And in the background was a very, very large, six foot something tall man, bearded, uh, who had a sundress on. And uh, that is when... When you dress in something that is overtly for the other sex, or you are trying to appear that way by the way you dress, um, so uh, and and granted, you know, I don't think anybody is sinning to, um, you know, if you're if you're dressing up for some costume ball, you're trying to be funny. I don't, God is not like, you know, my goodness, did it touch your body? You're a sinner. I'm going to throw you in hell. He's not like that. What it is, it, it has to do with the. What, what's perverse and twisted? What is sinful inside of you that is causing you to um, want to wear women's clothing when you're a man? This gets into the whole, uh, possibly at least, the transgender issue that we're right in the middle of in our nation, where a boy wants to be a girl, a girl wants to be a boy. He's saying, not even, don't even wear the clothes of the opposite sex. Don't even play the game. Don't even let your imagination run into those areas. These things, and you would think, well, it's only clothes. 
But God's dealing with the heart. And he's saying the hardest problem. Yes. 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 And I think I think it and it's the heart that's there. Because we know women who wear jeans, boots, and cowboy uh, clothes, like you said, but they very much are trying to attack attract cowboys. Right? And they 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 wear it in a way that it attracts cowboys. They don't wear it in a way that they look like a, a burly man. So um but isn't it interesting that God would even go after dress? And he goes after dress because he's really going after the heart. He's not so interested in clothing. He's interested in the heart. And if you think about it, back in the days of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and all these guys, it'd be hard to tell. You know, everybody's wearing a man dress, right? Everybody's wearing a robe. So is that a woman robe or a man robe? I don't know what that is, you know. But whatever it was, God was saying don't wear. So it may even have to do more with undergarments or or hairdresses or something. Because we, we know that women stood out as women in that day and men stood out as men in that day. And and he didn't even if we took it out of American clothing in society, there there is a differentiation in what somebody wears and how they present themselves. And so that too is an abomination. Let's now uh, Deuteronomy chapter twelve verse thirty one. Whoever wants to read that one, go ahead. Deuteronomy 12, verse 31. All right. That's an abominable act. Offering your children in the fire to a false god is an abominable act. I would say that very easily we can pull that and we could take another one of our modern sins in America, abortion. Now, is it forgivable? Absolutely. Does God love you even though you make those kinds of decisions at places in your life? He still loves you. He still will forgive you. He still wants to cover you with His mercy and restore you. But that is an abominable sin. It's murder of innocent blood. And you'd say, well, but if someone did it and they weren't doing it to a false god, is it really that bad? i got to not walk out of my camera view. I'll get complaints. Um, here's the thing to think about. Why does an abortion take place? If we ask the question. And I know the, the extreme view would be, well, because a woman was raped. Those are very, very, very few percentages. But even in that case, um, it's because of the person. They they don't want to carry something that was done in that way, and I can understand that totally. But the majority of abortions that happen, it's because, well, I wanted to go to college, or I wanted a better life. I didn't. I'm not ready. I don't have the money. It's going to be a burden to me. This child will be a burden to me. I don't want. To be humiliated. I don't want everybody to know I got pregnant when I wasn't married. Um, there's a lot of things, and I've, uh, you know, if you go back in the last 50, 80 years, you have Christian parents in some cases telling their kids, their daughter, to get an abortion because they wanted to save face. What is that all about? That's about worshiping my image, worshiping my good reputation, or worshiping my bank account, worshiping my future. If we did things that God said not to do in the first place, and now we have a child coming. Killing the baby doesn't fix your problem. It just made it worse. You took you took a sinful act and you moved it to the level of nauseating to God. An abomination. You took it to a whole other level by committing murder of innocent blood. So, again, this is, this is one of those areas and certainly uh, there, there are cults still today in the world that would require child sacrifice, but they were going to be very, very hidden because it would be illegal in every country. But if we were to go back uh, probably 500 years or something like that, the Aztecs, the Mayans, the Incas, the Perus, uh, Egypt, we can go through all of the different tribes of the land of Canaan where God moved and uh, moved the children of Israel in. They were kicked out of the land because of the things they were doing, offering their children in the fire, homosexuality, 
all of those things were ongoing in that land. That's why Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. That that was a people group in the land when Abraham was traveling through it long before the land was in Israel's hands, and they hadn't been kicked out yet. But that was the activity that was going on. And when you read around Abraham and Isaac's life as they're moving, that is an issue that continues to come up in cities where they try to rape men. Okay, I'm just going to turn it off. We don't need to slow down and do a word search anyways. I'm explaining the words to you. So, <laughs> All right, so let's keep going now to, uh, what are we at, Deuteronomy 17.1. Deuteronomy 17.1. I, right, I, I, wow, we're right at the end. I'm going to read these to get us through really quick. So, um, you shall not sacrifice the Lord to the Lord your God an ox or a sheep which has a blemish or any defect, for that is a detestable thing to the Lord your God. Now, this is the one that is most... Uh, I won't say confusing, but it makes me go, wow, really? I'm thinking you bring, you, you, you offer your child in the fire, and that's compared to bringing a lamb that is limping or is spotted or is sick and offering it as a sacrifice to God. But it is to God. So what do we do with that? Well, we start thinking, well, Why? Because this is our worship. When we bring things that uh, are not our second best, in a sense, we're serving and worshiping ourselves. It's, it's idolatry is what it is. We're saying, I'm going to keep the best stuff for me, which means I'm putting myself before God, and I'm going to give God the one that was going to die in a week anyways. Can you see why it's idolatry? Can you see why he calls it an abominable thing? Because you're making a choice to give him second best, or maybe third or fourth best, and to keep the best for yourself. And that, man, that convicts me. That convicts me now. The way I live life here. Am I giving God my very best? Am I giving Him the first fruits of my life? Is my tithe off the top, or is it if I have some left over? Because that's the question that's being asked here. And it's an abominable thing when we say, God, well, if I've got it, I'll give it. But we're going to go out to eat, we're going to go on trips. We're going to get ourselves into debt with motorcycles, boats, cars, houses, clothes, credit cards, TVs. You know, we're going to pay for all these cable bills. We're just going to boom, 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 just spin, 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 spin. But then we're going to say, God, I, now you know if I had it, I'd give it. <laughs> if I could afford to tithe, Lord, I'd be tithing, right? And he's saying out of this passage, that's an abomination to me. Because you're saying that you're making a choice. You're saying, I choose to spend all my money on me instead of giving what you've required of me. And, yes, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's good. Any evil flavoredness. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And God just kept kept taking it until he's I I I got the idea of I can't take it anymore. Man. It's been about a two year lesson for my son. He's he was raised in a house where we've tithed all of our lives and we've always taught them to. But he he just really didn't like the idea. <laughs> he wanted everything he made. And occasionally he'd give a little to God, but he didn't want to do that. And so we were like, you know what, it's 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 your money. But let me explain what things are going to begin to look like at some point. God will get everything that you should have given, and he usually takes more. Yes. Things will begin to go bad for you. You know, if you compare my daughter and my son, and you compare, and he could tell you this, and he probably would because he's, he's changed. <laughs> but if you compare the number of accidents and tickets and weird stuff that has happened to my son, girlfriend or friend that's a girl that drove it over a stump a few weeks back and now he's got a broke front bumper again you know he started tithing a while back but the consequences of not tithing for a couple of years 
he's still walking out the consequences of that. And it takes time. You've got to start sowing again before you start seeing the reaping and the blessing of God honoring what you're doing. And I, I tried so much to explain to him. Okay, When you slid into the back of that car and you were 16 because your tires were a little bit thin and all that, and you're all upset. I mean, we've replaced a front bumper on a Nissan. He's had an insurance call on his Mustang for a fender that got raked off. And it, a lot of times it's somebody bumping him. It's weird stuff that happens. But I'm telling you, it, it, other people will get the raise, the promotion, and you don't. And you're going, what's going on? Start obeying God. Start doing what God tells you to and let God have your finances. Let God be in control of what happens to you. Because when He's in control, all of a sudden, things begin to work your way and God doesn't have to get it from you in another way. He can get it from you this way. Does God need money? Not at all. He doesn't need money. What He's looking for is our heart. And, and, and there's an old song that says you're going to serve somebody. You're either going to serve God or you're going to serve the devil, but you're going to serve somebody. And you could put that into another verse and say, you're going to give to somebody. <laughs> you're either going to give to God or you're going to give to the devil, but you're going to lose the money somewhere. You might as well give it to God and let a blessing be upon you and give with a joyful heart. And look there, I think we're going to have to end on giving because I'm way out of time. We're going to pick up next week and we will finish. Uh, let's see, we covered... 17.1, right? All right. So we'll get Deuteronomy 18 next week, and then we're going to move into another word that means abomination. Both Tu'ibah and Shekut both mean abomination, and both of them are used in verses. They're two different Hebrew words, but we'll get into these last three that use the word Shekut in all of these, and uh, we'll cover that. This is what's left. And... Uh, and then we'll move into terms that emphasize the results of sin. You're going to say, I'm going to be so tired of sin. I hope you are. <laughs>